Good evening, Republica. <laughs> Good evening. Um, I'm always glad to be back here. Uh, tonight I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence, about the world we're building, and a little bit about activism uh, that might take the world in a better place than it's headed right now. And I've been on this stage before, that's why I say I'm always happy to be here. A couple of times ago, I talked about the growth of digital empires. I think that was three years ago. And it was interesting, at that time, it felt like a big and surprising thing to say uh, that there's five tech companies ruling the world and they're exporting a, a particular way of doing things, much like Europe exported colonialism in the 19th century. It doesn't feel like that is a surprising thing to say today. And the following year, I talked about teddy bears, uh, but I talked about the growth of the Internet of Things and how we're weaving the digital world into all aspects of the physical world around us in a way that is truly becoming pervasive. And again, that didn't seem like a, it did seem like a surprising thing to say at the time, but it really isn't now. I think we all know and see that. And in both cases, I asked the question, what kind of digital planet do we want? We're weaving together this digital environment around us, an ecosystem much like the planet itself. But unlike the planet, we can decide, because we build it, how we want it to go. And that's the same question I'm going to ask tonight. But I'm going to ask it a little bit in a different context. And I'm going to ask it, what kind of digital planet do we want in relation to artificial intelligence and robots. And hopefully it is not like a 1950s cartoon. And as I get into that theme, I'm picking up the, the theme of the conference, the theme of Republica here, which is too long didn't read or too long don't read. Uh, and that's actually a, you know, a fine thing to do to summarize or just ignore if it's an email from your boss where she or he is just whining on or it's you know some summary of something uh, you know trivial and it's all of the information we go uh, get in front of us every day but with artificial intelligence which is really just the next era of computing it's not a thing in itself we do need to go slower and get dig in more quickly or deeply and, you know, why do I say that, or what's the starting point of the, the TLDR that we have right now? It's one that is incredibly simplistic, as AI gets talked about more and more in the media. It's either AI is going to kill us, or AI is going to coddle us and, and keep everything safe and perfect. And, you know, Elon Musk has become famous as the one side of it, sort of hailing that... AI is going to be horrible, it's scarier than North Korea and all of its missiles. And, of course, this picks up all of the, the tropes from science fiction, whether it's The Matrix or The Terminator, or in this case, 2001, A Space Odyssey, where an early AI, Hal, almost kills uh, Dave, the, uh, the astronaut. And so that's a big part of the simplistic TLDR narrative about AI that we live with. And of course, the flip side of it is just as simplistic. And here's Jeff Bezos of Amazon saying, it's going to be wonderful, a golden age, just like sci-fi. And of course, he's not imagining The Matrix or Terminator uh, or 2001 A Space Odyssey. He's imagining something like The Jetsons. Beautiful sci-fi with dancing robots, cleaning our houses. Uh, and in fact, that's what Jeff Bezos is trying to build. So if, as, a, as a Canadian, I grew up watching a lot of American cartoons. Um, that is very much burned in my mind. And this is the binary. It's going to be great. It's going to kill us. It's going to be great. It's going to be kill us. That, that doesn't help. And it doesn't, it's not only a problem in terms of it being a narrative, this same simplicity, simplisticness, is showing up you know, even in policy. Now, it's not surprising it shows up simplistically in his policies, um, but the US, uh, Trump just signed an executive order promoting investment in artificial intelligence, much like you've seen those kinds of things in, in many parts of the world, including in Europe, 
government investment in AI? And that, that's not the question. I mean, that's an interesting thing to engage with. Uh, the, the piece that's interesting is just the promise of magical economic improvement, national security, and quality of life. It's that same Jeff, Jeff Bezos kind of magic robot AI narrative. And what I want to talk about today is just stepping back from that narrative <laughs> and being a little bit critical. I know often she's seen shaking the hand of the robot, but being a little bit critical uh, and thinking what's actually going on here and trying to understand. So the, the biggest argument I'm making today is we need to read slowly and carefully as we think about where we are taking AI. And I underline that we because it is still up to us to say where we want to take it. We still live in democratic societies. It's here where I come from, and we can decide. So first, a little bit of definitions. Uh, and, and the first part of the definition is AI isn't really a thing. Uh, it's kind of an umbrella term that many people use in different ways. But if it walks on its own, it talks, it listens, it reads, it recommends things for you, that's roughly the kind of thing that I mean when I'm talking about AI. A big part of that is machine learning, which, which most people here will probably know is actually sucking up huge amounts of data, the kind that are created by us every day as we use the online platforms, looking for patterns and learning for things, seeing you know, what, this, what kind of content you might like or what kind of um, object this looks like. So that's roughly what we're talking about. And it's not good or bad. It's, as I say, just the next era of computing, as the internet was the next era of computing 25 years ago. It is where technology is going. Like the internet, it's helpful to think about what values do we want to bring to the table as this technology evolves, because a lot of decisions get made at these key junctures. And of course, or maybe not of course, it is becoming the case that there is somewhat more nuanced debate emerging in the internet. Um, and almost always in that front cover of that debate, although it's starting to change as well, you know, China is in the story and is, is in the kind of role of the villain, uh, with, for good reason uh, in many cases. And so here's a kind of story I've seen many more of recently, uh, China and its facial recognition scans, using them to track its Islamic minority. And you usually see a picture like this with it, which is you know, all of the, the things that actually come with a bunch of this technology, right? You know, heat maps and sensors, seeing what's going on, and some facial recognition stuff, and like a lot of surveillance, a lot of discrimination, a lot of use of the technology for control. And personally, that does worry and horrify me and is going on. But again, it's, it's actually a, a too simple version of the story because it isn't that just AI is in the hands of states that might have different values in, uh, than us. AI is everywhere, every day, all around us. And so it's worth, as we kind of look definitionally, to just make sure we're all grounded in that. I'm sure everybody in this room is, but just as a review, if you use Spotify or Apple Music or Google Music, you're using lots of AI, especially if you, you use the kind of, you know, just let it recommend stuff to you. Like just a quick poll, how many people just let those music services recommend things for you? A fair number, most of you. And you know what's happening is just lo looking at what you listen to, looking at what other people listen to. As you can see, Apple is looking at what my friends listen to, digging into my privacy, digging into to, uh, what it knows about me and the world, and then making usually pretty good recommendations. And that's something I like, and probably if you put your hand up, you like as well. So that's, that's AI. That's one of the things we mean by AI. It's the same kind of recommendation engine that runs behind YouTube. If you went to watch my last year talk, which I'm sure you did before coming here. You might also want to watch a yoga video, because I did. Uh, or it knew me, because it needs, knows that I need to know how to start a speech. But it's the same kind of technology, recommending uh, things based on what it knows about us, just big data, but also really seeing large patterns. Same kind of thing behind self-driving cars. The Tesla, of course, is more famous, but I thought I would bring something more homegrown to the table. So, you know, this is something that is just going to be in the everyday. And in fact, it's in a lot of current model cars that aren't self-driving. The same technologies are being tried out, like sensing and braking, uh, and then actually fed back into the whole corpus of machine learning. And you know, this lovely, I'm sure, American family has its Amazon Alexa on the, the counter. The kind of home devices, also very much a part of the everyday of AI. 
And Amazon's actually gotten to the point that it's decided or is selling the idea that this should be built into every home all the time. So it's selling whole suburbs that uh, have Alexa built in. So much as you would have plumbing or wiring, you'll have Alexa. Um, there may, may be some problem with lock-in to a particular company uh, and other problems. But you know, it's kind of getting to this level of the, of the everyday. And of course, you know, there's a, a very small number of companies who are the leaders in this. How many people in the room, please raise your hand, even you know, if you're shy, use a product by at least one of these companies, right? And so these are the nine companies that basically control AI on the planet, where it's going, how it works. If you're a researcher in a university and you want to do anything in AI, you better be working with these companies because they have the data and they have the computing power to actually innovate in the underlying technology. They're not the only users of it, of course. They're not the only developers, but they really do drive it. But the 100% the of hands that went up speak to the fact that we are all immersed in AI every day. And it's mostly invisible to us, and this crowd's probably a bit different, but for most people, it's not something they understand or think about. So why worry? You know, all this stuff is, is you know, in the things we use every day, most of which we enjoy. And for me, the, the starting of why worry is actually about that simplistic narrative. And at least in this next tweet, uh, Elon Musk predicts that symbiosis is a, a possibility, but he puts out the binary. We're either going to become irrelevant or there's going to be doom. And the, the problem for me is not only that that... Um, you know, that narrative is simplistic, it erases us. There is no possible agency that we could choose between doom and irrelevance. It's something that is happening to us. And that, frankly, is bullshit. And that's the thing that I really want us to be thinking differently about. We need to put ourselves in the story of where the technology is going, and we need to dig into what are the real world problems we're worried about. Not some future doom or some future paradise, but where's the technology benefiting us today? but also where are their problems today? Because if we can dig into those problems, we can actually figure out how to fix them. More importantly, we can learn how to identify when new ones come up and have the muscles and the laws and the intelligence and the technologists and the philosophers and everybody else we'll need as we go into this next era to tackle problems as they come. So what I want to do is just quickly go into three examples of problems we know exist with the current era of AI, um, just so we understand them and talk a little bit about how some people are tackling them. But it's mostly just like, what does problem look identification that isn't about doom or nirvana look like? So example of one problem that is now incredibly well documented that is emerging with AI is bias. And so, as I've said, and, and as most of you know, you know, there's all of this data going in to train AIs to you know, make decisions often. And you know, as one might imagine, that data um, brings with it a set of values, experiences, like where the data comes from matters. And the first people to really break that in a public story was this now famous article by ProPublica, Julia Angwin, and a number of other people that looked at risk assessments to decide whether you get parole, what your um, bail requirements might be, basically what the justice system in the US uses um, to make a bunch of those real world decisions about people. And what they showed is that because the data comes from historical sentencing data, which is of course based on the racist history of the US, reflects those biases, where people who are actually been shown to be more likely to recommit a crime and people who are first time offenders get, you know, opposite of what you would expect in terms of risk assessments. A black woman getting a nine, even though she's only ever had a misdemeanor and is 18, and a repeat offender, including of armed robbery, who's white, getting a, a risk assessment of three. And so that's been shown over and over again. There's, there's a couple of books about it, uh, including Kathy O'Neill's Weapons of math, dis math Destruction. So we know bias is a thing. Uh, and despite that, it continues to get deployed automated decision-making systems without any, um, any kind of cleaning or, or reflection on what the data is continue to get deployed in these kinds of applications. And so we know that's a problem. You have bad data in, racist data in, you get bad outcomes, racist outcomes. Uh, and, and we haven't solved that problem yet, but we at least know that is a problem. It's not only a problem, though, in things like policing. It comes up in, like, everyday stuff 
that we don't necessarily pay attention to. So if you search for doctor, uh, just doctor, not any other adjective, you get almost all white doctors. And that's true if you search for baby, if you search for parent. And so the, the data sets come from the data that, in this case, Google is bringing forward. And it's not just about the number of images, because this is not based on, on kind of manual tagging. This is based on effectively facial recognition and categorization. And you, know, you see the same thing, unsurprisingly, on more sophisticated uses of AI, like ad targeting. This just came out in the MIT Technology Review, looking at uh, white users. 72% 70, of the people who see ads, job ads for Lumberjack are white users, uh, whereas 70% of people who see job ads targeted for janitor and taxi are non-white users in the US. And so you know, there's systemic bias in the training data being used by, by these systems. And we know it's there, and we have to figure out what we do about it. And of course, there is a, a recent German example that they're still trying to dig in further, is looking at Shufa, the credit scores, uh, and seeing who gets bad credit scores, which means maybe not getting a credit card, maybe not getting an apartment. Uh, and there just seems to be bias there. And the, the challenge, of course, is the, the Shufa doesn't want to give out the data. Even what it gives out through GDPR requests is incredibly limited. But you know, we see this in so many aspects of where we start to rely on machines to make decisions. And the last example, um, again, a recent paper that just came out, facial recognition in self-driving cars, seeing white faces better than black faces. So again, the same pattern, and in this case, something that would be not human controlled and lethal. So I give this example not to raise alarms and, and send us running out of the room because of this bias problem. It is very serious, but especially because it is very serious and we need to figure out how we dig in to solve it. Because those of us of good intention and who want an equitable society can tackle this problem and solve it. It is not a robot from outer space. It's a thing we can tackle and fix through technology, through legislation, through many other means. And I'll get to that in the end. But just two other quicker examples. Um, the second is measles. Uh, you could substitute this for lost elections to, um, in my opinion, crazy right-wing leaders or island nations leaving, England, or leaving Europe. Uh, we have a problem with misinformation, which is well known, that impacts lots of different things, democracy, public health. And you would wonder, why would I put measles up here related to AI? Partly, if you read the small sentence, you probably can't see it at the back, and the subhead says, uh, for the first three months of this year, there's added concern over the impact of anti-vaccination com campaigns. So we don't know for sure that the anti-vaxxers have led to the 300% rise in measles, but we do know there is a very vocal and active anti-vaccination movement in many parts of the world, and measles is one of the things they encourage parents not to vaccinate their kids for, and that those rates are, are going down. So how does this tie to AI? Well, it, it ties actually back to Apple Music and Spotify. Not really, but it does tie to recommendation engines, in that we know that the recommendation engines on sites like YouTube, but it's also on Facebook, it's also on, on Amazon, will often take us to a very different place than why we came. Uh, and this is just a kind of a, a cute but chilling uh, tweet from the other day that I happened to run across where um, McKenna says, the best way to test the YouTube algorithm is accidentally falling asleep to beauty vloggers and waking up to this. And what the, this is, is these like really convinced conspiracy theorists going behind the gate at Area 51 to prove that the government is hiding uh, aliens from us and that you will be shot if you, and they interview like an ex-guard of Area 51 uh, who's dressed up in a camouflage outfit. Um, it, I mean, it's just crazy stuff. And YouTube, of course, is full of this. But the point is that the algorithms are, for some reason, recommending it to us. It, you know, if people want to believe in Area 51, they want to believe in Area 51. But the fact that many of us get pushed through stuff and it's very systematic is something to question. And one of the first people who came out and questioned it is, is this guy, Guillaume Chasseau, who used to work at YouTube on, uh, for a period of time he was there, uh, on the, the kind of recommendation algorithms. Um, and he's talked a lot about uh, what goes on with them, including, you know, the, the, 
he and others have, have certainly been able to show this. The important basic fact that 70% of YouTube views are from the recommendation algorithm. So 70% of what people see isn't what they went looking for. And it goes on autoplay. And I think in the US, the statistic is the average consumption is an hour a day. There's 1.5 billion YouTube users. So the amount of video consumption driven by the recommendation algorithm is huge, like phenomenally huge. And the important thing is the recommendation algorithm is just an algorithm. It does what it's told, or it does what it, it can with the data it's fed. And the, you know, the data it's fed is what keeps people's attention. Um, you know, do people watch sensational crap like Area 51 conspiracy theory, theory people, or anti-vax videos, uh, or anti-Hillary Clinton hate videos? Uh, it turns out the algorithm thinks yes. Um, but the other thing it's given is a set of business rules. And the primary business rule it's given is keep people on the site as long as possible so they keep watching ads. And so the, the side effect, of course, of those two things together is the algorithm biases towards, and this has been proven by many different researchers, more and more radical content within three to six videos. And so a lot of people are seeing a lot of stuff that well, it isn't illegal. I wouldn't want to make it illegal. illegal. I'm a big believer in free speech. Uh, it is not what you'd be seeking for, and it is polarizing. And we're, we're, again, we're seeing these problems emerge. It doesn't mean it's the end of the world, but let's understand them and understand the role of AI in them and tackle them. And there's a really good argument on this piece that one of our Mozilla fellows, Rene Resta, made, which is free speech is not the same as free reach. That just because we believe that we want free speech on the internet, again, I do, doesn't mean that we want the amplifying tools to lend themselves towards stuff that polarizes our society and drives misinformation, puts cracks in democracy, makes it very diffi difficult to have a civil society and civic debate. And that's one of the things to kind of work out. And you know, she specifically has worked a lot on this anti-vax thing. This is another article by her, and she's, she's got similar information from about Pinterest, about YouTube, but in this case she wrote a piece about Amazon. And what it just shows is that the, the algorithms really can be gamed by people who have got some very aggressive intent in mind but don't, wouldn't normally have a large audience. And so she showed how basically the, the number one vaccine book uh, in Amazon for a period of time was an anti-vax conspiracy book and how they get really popular because it's, you know, it's based on getting people to make impulse purchases uh, and they can be gamed. So there's a challenge of how the algorithms meant to make money through more ads or more book sales lend themselves to polarizing and radicaling content. And you know, the, the good news, I think, even more than the bias case, in fact, much more than the bias case when you look at how the big tech companies have responded to it, you know, even Facebook and, and certainly YouTube, this is Esther Wojcicki, the, the CEO of YouTube, have responded. And the challenge is how much have they responded? Uh, we can't tell. One of the real locus, and I'll get to this a little bit as, as well, one of the real loci of um, activism that's needed is actually amongst researchers to just try to see as the tech companies who are incredibly opaque say they're trying to respond to some of these problems, um, are they? And we, we just can't see. Is everybody okay? <laughs> All right. Clearly I said something bad. Um, so there's another thing. Digging into misinformation at its root which is the business model and the recommendation algorithms as a key piece and not just the people who have malintent politically. Another thing we can dig into, it's not rocket science, it's not fighting robots from the sky, it's something that we as humanity can do. So just my last example, and, and it probably isn't a surprising one, especially if you know me, this is also a problem. The fact that we have nine tech companies, and it's interesting, it's the, it's the big five we normally know in the West, the three big Chinese companies, uh, and IBM, that these are the powerhouses driving AI, in my opinion, is a problem in and of itself. They're the only ones with the computing power and the amount of data to really drive innovation uh, in AI, and, and that means they're setting the agenda. Not only setting the agenda in terms of the technology itself, but there's a good 
report by the Royal Society that talks about it means that they are setting the agenda in terms of policy because there's nobody else with the pockets and the experts to sit in on policy conversations uh, on these topics. And it's interesting, Amy Webb recently put out a book just over the last couple of months called The Big Nine, talking about those companies and their dominance of AI. And it's interesting, I found this like marketing slide from before the book came out where she says, the Big Nine are not the villains. In fact, they're our best hope for the future. And I, I said, huh? And, and it, it did make me think a bunch. Because I, I, in one way, it is true that at least in theory, some of those companies, especially the American ones, do have an interest in this not going apocalyptically. Um, and you know, we do, and, and others do, and, and we should work with them to think about how to you know, how to make things go better than they might uh, if we didn't push them in the right direction. There's something called the Partnership for AI that has a lot of those companies at the center of it that fund, fund it. And we have started to participate because it does, it's good to encourage them to do what, what they might. But the fact that we have really a huge part of the future of humanity in terms of the shape of this technology, how it works, how it's constrained, uh, in the hands of so few people, like, that has to be bad. They really govern themselves. They are ungovernable on this stuff, this stuff despite Europe really being the, the only place that has tried. And we need a say. And so certainly encouraging them to go in the right direction doesn't hurt. We'll keep doing it. But that much power over something so important in the future, concentrated in so few hands, over something so important in the future of humanity, to me, there is something wrong there and is one of the problems. And again, it's not robots from space. We have fixed this problem before, where too much power is in too few hands in the market and broken it up or nationalized it, which I'm not arguing for, um, but who knows. Uh, but you know, we, we know how to deal with these problems. Uh, so we should dig in. So that brings us to the, the kind of back end of this talk of what are we going to do? And I, I hope there's many people uh, in this room that feel the, the same way. Um, you know, one thing we could do is hire a superhero, uh, a nice white 1950s superhero. Actually, I guess they're two. They're both superheroes, although the dynamic there is a little interesting. Um, and, but the, uh, you know, the other thing to do is look to the history of activism and social movements. And you know, there's a number of social movements you can put in here. I put the environmental movement because that's where I spent a lot of my life before getting into tech. And the thing I like about whether it's the environmental movement or the civil rights movement or feminism and the women's movement, they stand for something that they put popular power behind. And, and frankly, I think those social movements are the few of the, and others like them, things that have actually shifted humanity in the right direction when we've needed it. And they've done it in ways that are hard and long and incomplete. But they are critical, in my mind, to moving things along in a better direction. And importantly, they're also adaptable to the, the challenges changing over time. You know, it, it isn't just deforestation or smog or nuclear energy or climate change that the environmental movement has tackled, uh, and, and again, the same is true of all those movements, they adapt with an analysis over time and say, let's take us in a better direction, let's look at the problems in front of us today, and let's bring to people together to act. And the good news is, you are starting to see that happen. Uh, and Mozilla sees itself as one small part of a growing movement for a healthier digital world. And some of the things we are doing, others are doing as well, are the, the obvious things you would think Mozilla would do in AI, which is build stuff. Uh, and this is something where there's a lot of, of people who work on this here in Berlin called Common Voice. It's part of a broader set of things that have open source, basically voice technology, like the technology behind Alexa and Google Home. And of course, if we have that open source, it means that anyone can innovate as well as you can get languages in from uh, you know, people from lots of different parts of the world. Uh, similarly, there's a need, and I would consider activism, to include teaching, helping us understand. And this is Stefania Druga, who we talk about in the Internet Health Report, teaching young kids about AI and seeing that they actually get it much faster than their parents. And at Mozilla, we're looking at the sort of university end of that, which is we've started to work with professors to build ethics into undergraduate computer science uh, curriculum, 
with the idea that if you want to take out bias, if you want explainable AI, if you want AI that we can all understand, you need a generation of people who not only can build it, but who are driven to build it. There are also just the question of like who is represented in making these decisions in tech companies. And as you people may or may not know here, Google did a horrible job of setting up an ethics board recently that included um, at least one right-wing wacko. And the, what I loved about this MIT technology review, which gets better and better on this stuff, offered an alternative ethics board for, for Google, which of course they did not take them up on. And this is Rashida Richardson of AI Now, who's amongst a number of people who are part of this activist push for a better world of AI. Similarly, this is um, Joyce Bulawani, who is that also um, based in the US in Cambridge, and she's working on, she's both been somebody who has told the story of bias in facial recognition, and is working on pushing companies to balance out the data that is in, you know, that they have in their facial recognition systems. And she says she has seen improvements from some of the companies like Microsoft, and seen real pushback from companies like Amazon. And then, Back closer again to, to home, uh, we have worked with about 50 organizations across Europe pushing Facebook on ad transparency around the EU election. And not so much that that is an AI piece itself, but directly pushing companies on particular features is something that consumer power can do, and that we're going to start doing on a number of these algorithmic questions. And then uh, the last sort of activism example is Algorithm Watch here in Berlin and the sort of way they crowdsourced uh, people's GDPR data or get, got people to do GDPR requests to feed into that Open Shufa project. And I'll just say, you know, beyond the activism at the grassroots level, I do have a lot of hope for Europe in this regard and, and in terms of taking this in the right direction. What has happened with the GDPR and other things starting to step up to the tech companies, also on antitrust in the US, watching as China starts to become an export market, which I'm sure they will arrive here with a number of their consumer products sooner than we all think. There's an opportunity for government to help AI go in the right direction. And that's sort of what I'm talking about. It's, it's not that we don't want to see companies building technology, but we can push for it to go in a direction that is good for all of us and that actually sees the problems uh, as they arise. And so, you know, what kind of planet we want for me is not a clear cut, which is where we may go, but one where we actually are planting the trees and building a healthy digital environment. And Part of getting there, the first step, is breaking apart that simplistic narrative of the partying robot and the scary robot. And one of the things we've started to do is work with uh, artists, including Noah Levinson, who just launched Stealing Your Feelings at the Tribeca Film Festival last week. And you know, he's done an amazing job of using facial recognition on you, where you can see what's going on, see what the advertisers can see, see how much your face tells the advertisers you like pizza, tells you about your racial bias, and lets you see that this technology is around us all the time. And I think just starting to have that conversation with people and then digging in on the problems is something we all should be doing. Thank you very much. We will be